What is backstory? It's everything that happens to your characters before your story begins. Where do you get ideas for backstory? Almost anywhere you like. Newspapers, other books that you've read and found interesting, or films, or television series, myths or legends, history. There are no rules except that you should respect your sources. And I would suggest that if you take somebody else's story, uh, you do not make it recognizably theirs, just as you wouldn't like it if somebody knew all about you and used you in a story. Well, the signs of it, the way it affects people's characters, how they behave, what they value, what they're frightened of, what they look for, every time that you see them, it will affect who they are. But you drip it in little bit by little bit, so that you add flavor and distinction and just an air of mystery and tension to that person. But you keep the whole secret that is revealed until as late as you possibly can. It might be part of the solution of your mystery, or it might be something that leads you in the completely wrong direction which can be fun also. Backstory is going to affect the behavior of the person concerned in all the things they do. Their fears, their likes, their dislikes, their hopes, their expectations, even their personal habits. As an example, you might say, so-and-so loved to have pancakes and syrup for breakfast. That's a little quirk of, of character, perhaps tells something about their past, but it doesn't really lead you into who they are. If you were to say, so-and-so likes pancakes and syrup for breakfast because it reminds him of the times he used to visit his grandmother and she would make pancakes for him. She was always telling him what to do, don't talk with your mouth full, take your elbows off the table, but she listened to him in a way that nobody else did. Now you've got a clue as to the fact that possibly he had a lonely childhood. Maybe his mother and father were too interested in other things, too busy to listen to him. But his grandmother, she bossed him around, but she loved him. She listened. And maybe being listened to is something that's terribly important to him. And you've got all that in, just in a tiny little thing, he liked pancakes and syrup for breakfast. Now, perhaps you can think of something in your life or the life of somebody you know that would be just such a little exercise. They liked, they disliked, so-and-so, and then a memory attached to it. A memory of getting up and being cold every morning. And one person who said, don't forget your scarf, every time you left the house. Uh, all sorts of little things like that would give you a clue as to what this person valued, where they felt loved, where they felt as if they were not loved. Something that's an ache they're still looking to heal, even throughout their life. They could be 40, 50, 60 years old. But that little memory is something that's part of them. Don't ever tell us something if you can show us. And these little cameos can be a key to a hold of who somebody is inside. I can remember walking down a very busy street in London with my father, who's a very unsentimental man, in that he'd be the last person on earth to think of superstition. It would, he was a scientist, it just nonsense to him. And yet there was an old soldier, disabled, at the side of the road, selling what he called lucky white heather, as if wearing a plant of a particular color on your lapel is gonna make good things happen. But my father stopped and overpaid him for a couple of pieces and put one on my lapel and one on his. And as he walked on down the street, I could see the tears in his eyes. That to me is a perfect cameo of who he was underneath the things he said and the manner in which he said them. I'd like to give you a few suggestions of backstories that may make characters react completely differently and to the reader inexplicably 
to the various things that happen in your plot. I was looking at the newspaper a couple of three weeks ago and I saw an article about a man, who looked to be in his late 30s, maybe early 40s, who had just been released from prison after having served 17 years for a crime which had now been proved he did not commit. Now, just that one instance set off a rush of ideas in my mind, as I think it probably will in yours. First of all, if he did not commit that crime, his dignity and his lack of bitterness and hatred, anger, was very, very admirable. But how about all the other people who must have been involved? What if you were the eyewitness who gave testimony that actually sealed the conviction? How do you feel about it? You must have, you surely believed at the time you gave the evidence that you were correct and this was a man you saw and you were doing your duty. But clearly you were wrong. This was not the person you saw. How do you feel about having taken 17 years out of a man's life? Damaged him irreparably. He'll never get that time back or the things he lost because of it. Do you feel that perhaps you were right and he was guilty? Somehow or another somebody else has made a mistake? Do you convince yourself, I did the right thing? Or do you think, well, perhaps I was tired, I was confused, I thought it was the right person, the police said that they knew from other evidence that it was him, but they just needed me to make sure that he was convicted and you wanted to please them and you were frightened of what they might do to you if you said no. You'd be branded a coward. You might even be accused of being complicit with him. So you, you went ahead and you said, yes, that's the man. I saw him. Or perhaps you wanted to defend somebody else you knew and cared about who might have been suspected if this man were not convicted. Your memory, it's 20 years ago. How do you even remember what you felt? But you must feel guilty now unless you can find an excuse for it. Maybe you were tired, you were confused, the police were badgering you, everybody else said, go on, it's your duty, it's your duty, you've got to do it. He's guilty, we know he's guilty. You're the one that's got to stand up there and make sure he gets put away. And now you realize he was not guilty. And what you did was mistaken, or was it wrong? Were you just confused or were you guilty? Maybe you wanted to be the hero of the hour, and so you were a bit more easily persuaded than you should have been, and now you feel dreadful. Is that going to cripple you from now on, and all you can think of every time you close your eyes is that you put away an innocent person for 17 years because you were frightened or careless or clumsy or proud or wanted to be liked and praised? Or possibly you're going to turn this to a completely different result. You are going to say, this man was put away on false eyewitness. And apparently eyewitness is the least reliable of all evidence. But we haven't known that for so very long. Maybe you are going to become an advocate. And you are going to make very, very sure that if you can help it, nobody is going to be put away on unreliable eyewitness evidence. And you become so good at this, you don't let any eyewitness get away with the slightest error. You remember how easy you were to persuade. And now, every time an eyewitness comes up, you can cross-question the so-and-so out of them. Imagine how your hero feels if they are a prosecuting lawyer or a policeman, and uh, they have against them this lawyer that will not give your eyewitness a chance that you are trying to coach and help an eyewitness who definitely believes they saw of somebody, but they're frightened, they would love to back out of it, and here you've got a lawyer who rips them to bits on the stand, shows up all their past weaknesses, errors, their eyesight, where they were, their sobriety, etc. Why will they not let that go? Maybe this other instance, 17 years earlier, is the backstory to your lawyer who now is going to make jolly sure nobody else ever makes a mistake that they did. You see, the possibilities are endless. Not just the uh, witness, how about the prosecutor? Did they really even look for any other evidence? Were they so sure that the eyewitness evidence would do it and they were determined to get this person? Maybe it was important to their career that they did it. 
how do they feel about having taken 17 years out of somebody's life? Or do they say, well, that's the game. I'm there to prosecute. If I'm too good at it, tough. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. Or perhaps they're now trying another case where they're absolutely certain that somebody else is guilty. But they were certain before, and they were wrong. Does that stop them from being able to be effective in their job? Are they haunted by it? Are they guilty? Do they wake up in the night sweating, thinking, what have I done? How many other people have I put away who might have been innocent? Or the defense counsel? Did they say, well, I was appointed by the court. I knew he was guilty. I just put up the necessary uh, performance so that it could all go ahead. I didn't really try. I didn't really defend him because I was sure he was guilty. Well, he wasn't. And perhaps if you'd put up a decent performance, he wouldn't have been found guilty. If you'd really cross-questioned the witness properly, maybe the evidence would have fallen to bits and he wouldn't have been found guilty. Do you carry that as guilt? Does it disable you? Does it make you quick-tempered? Too quick to, to respond to other people because you're angry with yourself and you don't want to think about it? Maybe you drink just a little bit too much to put the memory away out of your mind? Maybe that's your backstory for a subsidiary character. We hope it's not your main character because that's, that's a very tragic story. But then he might overcome it, or she. There are all sorts of possibilities. What about the police? Did they ever really look for anybody else or was this an easy out? Was it somebody they thought was guilty of something and they hadn't been able to get him before and so they uh, fitted him up a bit on this one? It worked perfectly. He looked guilty. There's your witness. Let's get it over and done with. Do you feel badly about that? Or do you feel that this is the chance of the job? There are so many possibilities. And one big one that stands out if he wasn't guilty, somebody else was. And what's happened to that person? Have they gone on and committed many other crimes which they would not have done if you'd got the right person in the first place? If you'd gone on looking for him instead of taking the easy way out? Does it make you now work twice as hard at everything you're doing? Or do you just feel hopeless and useless and the mistake haunts you and cripples you? I've often thought that it isn't the mistakes we make which are the measure of who we are, but how we deal with them afterwards. Do we get up and try harder? Own that they were our mistakes. Don't try and blame somebody else. And make jolly sure from then on we behave the best we can. Do we learn and profit from them? with some humility? Or do we say, well, it was never my fault. It's got to have been somebody else's. It's you or you or you or you. That's very much the measure of a person. Now, you can have this the backstory of any of your characters that a bad mistake was made. Do they own up to it? How much has it changed their lives? How much, when we meet them, is inexplicable until we understand, little by little, that this is what happened to them in the past and why they now view things the way they do. And of course, there's his wife. Maybe she was loyal to him all the way through. Maybe she wasn't. Maybe she stuck to him for a certain time. And then after a time, it just got too lonely to live by herself. And she uh, began to accept that, yes, he was guilty. After all, I was wrong. I believed him as long as I could. This is the end of the road. And uh, she leaves him. She gets married to somebody else and uh, she teaches his children, well, yes, he, he was guilty. Uh, maybe they grow up thinking my father was a whatever it was, or maybe they grow up thinking my father was an innocent man and this is how the law treats innocent people. I have no respect for the law. I hate the law. To hell with it. And their lives go in a completely different direction. How can you respect a law that puts your father away for 17 years for something he didn't do? There are so many possible backstories just out of that one headline. Man found innocent after 17 years. The world is full of all kinds of backstories that mark a person's life in a way which is unexplainable until you know what this backstory is. Drip feed it in 
a remark here, a, a reaction there, until ultimately, towards the end of the story, you reveal this is why they behave as they do. But it's going to be there in every reaction that you meet with in your story, so you can make them real flesh and blood characters with tastes and ideas and beliefs and wounds that explain a lot of what they do. One of the best ideas I ever used as in a story myself was a backstory of Monk, one of my series heroes, who wakes up one morning in what he takes to be the workhouse until he realizes it's daylight and the beds are still occupied, which doesn't happen in workhouses in Victorian England. And they say to him, the police want to see you. And he says, why? And immediately the fear. If the police want to see you, we all of us have this, what have I done? And they give him a, a looking glass so that he can tidy himself up a little bit. And he looks at the face in the, in the mirror and says, who's that? He has absolutely no memory of anything at all. He knows his name because they've just told him. He knows that the police want him because they've just told him. Other than that, he knows nothing except that he hurts and he's in a bed in a hospital. And he has to make his way with the police who do not like him, which is very frightening, until he realizes from what they say that he is one of them. And the fact that they know him very well and don't like him is even more frightening. Imagine not knowing who you are, how you earn a living, who likes you, who hates you, or why, and trying to do your job when you get only flashes of memory. And these are flashes of familiarity with the crime that he's just been sent to solve. Now, that as backstory, I don't know who I am, works for me on several different levels. On the deepest possible level, we all of us have wondered about our own identity. Who am I? Who am I? Where do I come from? Not literally, but in an, in an existential sense. Have I any purpose here? What is my real identity? Not just my name, but my nature. And that search for self, an understanding of self, is, is universal and timeless. But in a very immediate sense, it gives me oceans of plot. Because every time he meets an unfamiliar person, and I'm on book 22 now, I think, and something has come out of the past, he meets somebody who dislikes him intensely, and he doesn't even know this person. Why? What did I do to them in a time I don't remember that they disliked me so much? Is it simply envy, jealousy, or did I really do them some injury for which they hate me? And I can't remember what it was. Some incident in the past can be a very powerful backstory for your reaction of your hero or heroine throughout all sorts of plots and situations. And with that particular one, I've got the added advantage that it can never be completely resolved because that kind of amnesia does not ever completely disappear. So you suddenly, ah, oh, yes, I remember everything. Anyway, who does remember everything? Don't we all have patches here and there? You said such and such. I, Did I? I don't remember. But nobody's got perfect recollection of everything they've ever said or done. Many, many people have major incidents or traumatic events in their lives that are going to haunt them always. And the, whatever it is about that time that's so particularly troubling is going to come back again and again. And it's going to alter the way they react to various events, people, situations, circumstances. And you can enrich their character. The one thing is to be sure you don't overuse it. I have just started reading Charles Todd's stories of uh, a man who suffered shell shock, very, very profound shell shock in World War I. Uh, Rutledge is the name of the hero, 
And I'm finding it fascinating because there must be more people than we can count from World War I, earlier than that, right up to the present day, whose behavior is completely inexplicable until you know that one thing. I used to be very quick to judge when I was a teenager. I hope I'm slowing up a bit now. But my mother used to say to me, but if you just knew the one thing more, you would understand that person so much better. And instead of anger and quick judgment, you would hesitate and you'd think, yes, there but for the grace of God go any of us and be a good deal wiser. I've got one story called The One Thing More when Everything seems to point to one conclusion because there's one fact you don't know in the backstory which turns a whole thing completely upside down. You can do that too with all sorts of things that can have happened to somebody. And I'll give you a few ideas, just starting points of things that you may be able to use as backstory for your, possibly for your main protagonist, maybe for somebody close to them, maybe for somebody who's in that story only. But the most important person that we frequently forget when giving a full, rounded, flesh and blood picture with backstory is the antagonist, whether they're actually a villain or not. They may simply be the person who's standing in the way of your hero getting what they want and not necessarily with any bad intent at all. Another area closely allied to that is this guilt that some survivors feel from war or from any other disaster. Uh, it could be something like a major fire where you're the one person who survived. It could be one of these atrocious attacks with gunfire where you were the one that survived when the rest of your school friends were either injured seriously or even killed. It can be any disaster at all, but of course war is such a consuming one and takes almost unimaginable numbers of people. Think how those feel, and you may well know somebody in this situation, those feel who survived relatively whole when the people who went with them, maybe from their own town, village, their own training camp, their own factory, when they did not come back or they came back so injured they would never be the same again. I think my stepfather suffered from that to some extent. He went through World War II, and whilst he was very severely injured, he was blown up inside a tank and his spine compressed, he survived and he was not disfigured. But he used to very, very occasionally refer to one or two of the men he knew, and he just, without naming anyone, he said, you could be standing talking to someone right beside you, and the next minute you're trying to get their entrails off your boots. There's nothing left of them but bits and pieces. How do you survive that? There were a real live person talking to you, your friend, right beside you, as whole as yourself. And the next minute, there's nothing left. People do feel guilty. Of course, there's nothing you did that caused that. It's just chance. But you carry the burden of being the one that survived for no reason, no virtue, no cleverness of your own just chance. And people do feel guilty if they survived. A fire, the sinking of a ship, an attack, bombing, anything that's dreadful. It, it doesn't leave them. It's got to make them different. I know that he never spoke of the war, as did not almost every other person I've ever heard of. People don't speak of things like that. The only ones they can share it with are those who, who experienced it themselves, and they don't tell their families, but sometimes they relive it in nightmare. And I know that my stepfather did right until the day he died, which was decades after the war. How do you deal with survivor guilt? Whether it's from something as major as a war or as minor as a small house fire where you're the one who survived, where maybe it was the rest of your family that didn't. Do you carry the burden the rest of your life? I could have, should have done something. I should have woken up sooner. I should have known which room they were in. I should have been able to break down the locked door. I am alive and I am faced with a full life 
when I have all the opportunities to do everything that a person can do, and they're not. And that does change the way people behave, the way they think, the whole value system. And apart from that one, similarly, how do we deal with the fact that people do suffer genocide and sometimes we know about it and we do nothing? How many people might have found refuge before World War II had we been willing to let them into our countries, our homes, instead of saying, no, I'm sorry, we're not, not here, not in my backyard, please. How many tragedies happen now of poisoned water or major fires spreading? And we say, well, yes, fix it up, but NIMBY, not in my backyard, not here, down the road. How many refugees now fleeing lives unimaginable to us? We say, well, of course, let them in, but not here. I'm not prepared to give up anything. They're different from me. They look different. They have different food, different customs, different tastes. Not, not in my backyard, please. And then do we, years later, when we know more of the truth, and we know many, maybe how many children were burned alive, starved, beaten, we think, oh, if only I'd known. When what you really mean is I could have known I didn't want to because that would have meant I had to do something. So I looked the other way. We're all familiar, I think, with the story of the Good Samaritan. And it's so powerful. And we all want to be the Samaritan, the good, good person who stopped by the wayside to pick up the injured and put them on our own beast, in our own car, whatever, and take them to the nearest hospital and leave means for them to be fed and looked after and go on our way with a wonderful, warm, bright feeling inside. Do we ever think what happened afterwards to the people who passed by on the other side? The ones that, ugh, that's a mess, that's ugly, I don't want to know. I don't want my clothes stained with his blood. Walk on and go round. Do we wonder what happened to them afterwards? I've more than once heard a very chilling story told in church of a man who was a doctor. And he was on his way to see his eldest son, and he was in a hurry. And he was driving along the road, and he passed by an accident. And he didn't stop to help, because he was in a hurry to meet his son. And when he finally got to where his son would have been waiting for him, they said, oh, did you not know he went out to meet you? Of course, you can guess the rest. That was the accident the doctor passed and did not help, and the son died. What happens to those of us who pass by? Do we think, well, I'm sorry, I can't do everything? Uh, I was busy. Or do we think I could have done? And are we haunted by the guilt of that? I don't want to know. I don't want to be involved. Maybe for the rest of our lives. And if we do, do we defend that position? Not my fault. Can't do everything. I didn't know. Or do we then change? And next time there's something we could help, we stop and we help. Do we believe that we're other people's keepers? Or do we think, no, no, I mind my own business? Have you had the experience of having a bad day when you've had bad news, you don't feel well, you're frightened, and somebody stops and smiles at you, and suddenly you feel as if the day's a little bit better? It doesn't cost anything a smile. How are you? People's behavior is different for so many reasons. Maybe the last person you smiled at bit back at you. What's it to do with you? Mind your own business. And you retreat and you don't do it again. It is a matter of choice, but it's also a matter of reacting to whether you're hurt inside and what's happening in your life. All these things are going to make your different characters behave differently. And to begin with, maybe your main character is going to think there are this or that, and make the judgment that they're mean, that they're callous, that they're brutal, that they're cold, that they're cruel, that they're uninterested in humanity. And little by little, you are going to drop the clues that there is something so much bigger behind that. I can remember a long time ago, I was working in a shop, and there was such a rude woman barging in front of other people. She actually put her arm right across in front of my face to reach for something. 
and I saw the Nazi concentration camp tattoo on her arm. And believe me, that moment I'd have passed her anything in earth she wanted. Because I realized that one thing that was in her backstory that was monumental that I didn't know. What a story she probably could have told. What of uh, possibly allied themes, such as if you are the child of parents who to you are mummy and daddy, they're loving parents, uh, they look after you, they play with you, they teach you, they're always there for you. And then as you grow a little bit older, you realize that some of the things that you have seen are not at all what you thought. And you discover perhaps that your father was a commandant of a concentration camp in Nazi Germany. Or perhaps he had some other job where it was his duty to kill civilians. Not just one or two here or there, but civilians who to their parents were exactly like you. No different, just little children growing up, doing the best that they could. And you discover that your father, possibly even your mother, was complicit or part of the destruction of genocide. How do you live with it? How do you look at another child and think that your parents could have killed their parents, not because they were threatening them in any way, but because they were prisoners and that's how prisoners were dealt with, because of their race or their religion or their occupation or, or something of the sort, that they had committed what we now come to, to term as crimes against humanity. Are you part of them? Are you part of the victims? Who are you and how do you come to terms with that? Surely you have to be different, even if you change your name, change your background and live differently. You've got to have desperately torn loyalties, guilt, disbelief, a sense of not belonging and a wondering if there's any part of your own heredity that makes you likely to do the same sort of thing. And on the whole question of war, how long do war reparations go on? I don't know that there's ever been a nation that's had power that hasn't abused it at some point. I read some of the history of my own people and it makes me sick to think that this is part of my heritage. Am I still in some way a partaker of that guilt? Or does it stop with the person who actually did something? Maybe that depends upon how you behave yourself, whether you profit from that or not. But the whole question of what is your hereditary uh, inclination, your position, the education, the wealth, the home, anything that you come from, how do you learn to square with it? And it may be something as simple as that your parents embarrass you. Is there anybody who's never been embarrassed about their parents, rightly or wrongly? just because they are maybe a little eccentric, a little different, hold political opinions that you find out of the norm and therefore you are embarrassed, because teenagers get embarrassed very, very easily by their parents. On a much lighter note, I can remember my father going to church on the only occasion I remember him going to church. It was um, at a school play of my younger brothers. And as he frequently went to sleep in the cinema, uh, he would wake up when the applause started. And uh, this was a very deeply religious service. And my father woke up at a no particular point, but it was talking about the crucifixion, and he was used to waking up to applause. So he woke up and started to applaud. I shot to the opposite end of the seat and pretended he was nothing to do with me. But that was a very simple, and he was a, he was a loved and respected man, how about if I discovered that he was something terribly different? If you create a character who has a heredity of something that embarrasses them, shames them, frightens them, they wonder if it's genetic and passed on, there you've got a completely different person who's going to react inexplicably to anybody who doesn't know what it is that haunts him. And he's not going to tell anybody willingly.
that comes out as all backstory that's really relevant to a good mystery, a good drama, does bit by bit by bit. The piece of, of behavior, the words, the reactions you don't understand. And it may not be at that moment that your hero says, well, why did he say that? Why did he do that? What's the matter with him? It may be only afterwards you get all the little pieces put together and you realize they form at least a frame of some big, big event or habit course of events that you haven't guessed at. And that's where you begin to put it together and you piece together that they may be guilty of something or they may not be. They have just behaved in a way which without the knowledge of that backstory is inexplicable. How about uh, politicians? And this would apply to the wife, the children, the immediate family of politicians. Recently we've been doing a lot of examination of uh, some recent political and military behavior. Politicians who were absolutely sure and got up on television and told the world they were positive that this or that was true and that if we behaved in such and such a way violently, invasively, whatever, then the result would be so-and-so. And they were wrong. They have now been proved absolutely to be not just wrong, but disastrously wrong. You can barely count the number in thousands of people who are dead because of certain actions. And yet, they have the hubris to say, no, no, we were not wrong, we were right. How do you come to terms with that? especially if you, as being possibly the next generation, can see, as the whole world can see, that they were not right. Do you argue about it? Do you defend them when your friends attack them? Do you find some way of, of trying to justify what they did? Do you go as far away as possible uh, in your opinions, or even literally geographically? How do you deal with it when your parents have done something I mean, they're not in jail for it. They're still free and they're still saying, yes, we were right. Because family loyalty is very, very strong. I, mean, I thought my father practically walked on water. And I've still got memories with me about two or three years old being allowed to help him weed the garden. And I was so little, I was still at the age where you bend from the waist and stick your bottom in the air to pick something up off the ground. I was allowed to help daddy. I don't know how I would deal with it if I discovered that he did something not only terribly mistaken, but that he stayed with it and still insisted that he was right when the whole world, including me, can see that he's not. How would I deal with it? I don't know. I still think that he was pretty well right. But what if he were proved not that he was a politician, he wasn't. But how do you deal with that? What tearing inside of your own loyalties do you have? And do you battle everybody else on his behalf? Or do you just avoid the argument altogether? Or do you say, well, yes, he was mistaken, but I don't want to discuss it because he's my father. Or I suppose it could have been your mother if your mother was in a position of making major decisions. Maybe, maybe not only political, might, might have been medical decisions. Although usually with that you'll say, well, science has surpassed us and we now know that that was not the best thing. But if the person sticks to their gun and says, no, 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 how do you live with somebody you love? What if it were your husband or your wife? How do you cope with it? What mechanisms inside you get to work to, to somehow justify whatever they did? because you still love them. They're still there. They're part of you, part of your life. And you know all the good things about them. But they may be private little things. You wouldn't be going around saying, well, yes, she nursed me when I was sick and she was there all day and all night, regardless of how tired she was. That doesn't answer the issue that she may have made major decisions which were wrong, for which other people have paid with their lives. And she's not going to say, no, I was wrong. She's, no, I was right. I'm never wrong. 
We all have flaws. There's nobody that doesn't have mistakes somewhere or another, acknowledged or unacknowledged. And sometimes those who acknowledge their mistakes and go on acknowledging them and on and on, that's just as difficult to live with. How do we behave as a reaction to defend ourselves and survive when we've got family who embarrass us in front of the whole village or in front of the whole world? A person's got to be a little different because of that. And maybe they have a backstory of having supported and then now being in a position where they need to deny because their own mind and their brains and whole of society tells them that their parent was fundamentally very wrong. That's got to be a backstory that colors how you behave, how you deal with it, whether you feel guilty because you're connected to them. And we do blame people for the faults of the rest of their family or society, sometimes for the rest of their nation. And I know people who are still blaming people who weren't even born when the offenses were committed. How long do you carry vengeance or forgiveness? We don't want to be blamed for things our great-grandparents did, and yet we're free enough sometimes to do it to others. And if you have been blamed very often for something that was nothing to do with you, how quickly do you jump and, rea and react, even when the person doesn't mean it? That would explain another entire raft of behavior because we didn't know. We haven't been in that position. We don't understand the quickness to take offense, the quickness to lash back. What did I do? I didn't do anything. Because we don't understand. The backstory is something that has driven that person through endless grief and pain and guilt and searching, and we've never been there. I think at the heart of almost all of us is a desire to belong, to find the place and the people where you feel comfortable and at home and as if you have a part in it that is your natural birthright, a sense of belonging. But there are many people who don't have that to such a degree that it is part of their character, that need to belong, and it's going to alter their behavior. And sometimes they're going to have a violent sense I'm not part of this, I'm a stranger here, I'm different, I'm alien. And at other times they're going to be prepared to do almost anything in order to fit in and be accepted. And I think if you think back to your own school days, new girl at school, new boy, the one that doesn't know, the one that doesn't have any friends yet, the one that's different, and you feel as if you're watched and you don't belong. It's a horrible feeling and it's something that we perhaps will never completely forget. During the war, there were many Jewish children across Europe who were saved when their parents were either fled or were exterminated, saved by people who were completely different from themselves, who were Catholic, Protestants, Christians of some sort, or at least a group that was not persecuted. And uh, they were known as les enfants cachés, the ones that were hidden in Christian families during the war, and those people risked their lives to take in these children, because if they'd been caught with them, they'd have gone to the concentration camp themselves, and no doubt so would their own children. If you were one of those children who were raised in a Catholic home to save your life, and even at the risk of the lives of the children and the parents who took you in, what loyalty do you owe to them? What they've given for you as a stranger is beyond measurement. And yet you still are the child of your own parents, your own heritage, your own religion. What a torn loyalty that would be and what a, great, a weight of gratitude you'd have to have if you were even fit to be called human. How much do you owe to whom? What about your own parents, your own heritage? I have a dear, dear friend who had 38 members of her family in Poland during the Nazi occupation. 37 of them went to the camps and were killed. One 
survived. You can't deny a heritage like that. What would you be if you, if you didn't even remember all those people who died just because they were who they were, their own identity? Nothing to do with anything they did. Many kinds of torn loyalties are going to torment and divide many sorts of, of, of people. What about adopted children? Do they owe their main loyalty to the woman who bore them, gave birth, and perhaps had them for a short while? And do, we, do they need to know why she gave you up? Did she die? Did she have some illness that she thought she would never recover from? Did she fall on such desperate times she couldn't feed you and you needed really seriously looking after with a degree of money and stability and she gave you up for your sake? Or did she simply not want to have you? Do you need to know? Do you want to know? Are you compelled to know? What is that going to do to her if she went on and married and didn't tell her husband she's got an illegitimate child somewhere? Is that going to ruin her life? Are you going to feel that you've betrayed the parents who've actually raised you because they loved you and wanted you, absolutely regardless of where you came from or anything else, and have spent their lives loving you? Divided loyalty is a desperately difficult situation. No decent person can have their loyalties divided and without feeling anything between uncomfortable and desperate about it. Perhaps there is some secret that one of your characters doesn't want to talk about and it's nobody else's so-and-so business. But that would alter their behavior. That would explain a lot of things. If they're searching for somebody, maybe they know that this or that person is their real mother or real father. And the person doesn't know. That would account for an awful lot of behavior that's otherwise inexplicable. A lot of searches, a lot of relationships, a lot of guilt, a lot of pain, sense of rejection, and back to that not belonging. A completely different kind of not belonging comes when you get very ordinary people with little education who do a menial job and somehow or another they give birth to a child who is a genius. And whilst that child is one, two, three, they're close-knit, they totally belong. When that child is eight or nine and needs to go to a much more advanced school than the local school, and by 11 or 12 is in a senior scholarship class, at 14, 15 matriculates with a scholarship to Oxford, Cambridge, or Sorbonne, or any of these big, big universities, and is speaking a language the parents don't even understand, never mind making references and learning things that far outweigh them. I know with my own father, he matriculated very, very young with a scholarship to Cambridge. And he, he remained loving his family. But, and he went home every, every so often. They were enormously proud of him. But because he was in the field of nuclear physics, he couldn't possibly explain to them what he was doing. They couldn't understand. And they were left with a, a gap of being so proud and no idea why. And he loved them because they were his parents, but he couldn't explain to them what he was doing. Now that must be something that happens many, many times. It's the old, you can't go home. Well, some people can, some people can't. That's got to give you a need to establish a whole lot of new roots where you do belong, because we all are emotional animals as well as intellectual. And maybe you're a brilliant, child prodigy with a violin. You've got two parents who are tone deaf. It could happen. We need to belong somewhere, and the need to belong is going to drive, and maybe is even a fundamental motivation, a lot of people. It's going to create new loyalties that an outsider doesn't understand. Well, why do you need so-and-so so much? Because of the one person who understands me, the one person who will listen when I talk who understands what my dreams are. My family doesn't, not because they're not good people, just they don't understand this particular path, which is the path I was made for. This person does. You can see some very strange marriages and think, what on earth do they see in each other? 
It's not our business. But these loyalties could form the basis of a story. Or it could explain somebody's behavior which without that understanding is complete nonsense. You look at two people who care for each other and you think, but there are this or that that that's not right and what do you see in them? They can't explain and why should they? But almost everybody needs to belong to something. With some people, the only one that loves them and understands them and doesn't judge them is their dog. But why do they rage at somebody who hurts their dog? Because that's where they've received love and loyalty, unquestioning. You know the famous saying, I wish I were the man my dog thinks I am. We all need to be loved, to be approved of. And that can form some very strange relationships. But that can be part of the backstory of somebody that behaves in a way which without understanding that, and you really will understand when you explain it, when you show them. Because we all understand the need to belong in a place, to a group of people, to one person, in one profession or art or science. We need to feel valued and that there's something we can reach out to touch, that touches us back. And it may be a religion, it may be a cult, it doesn't matter what it is, it's the need to belong. I know I've mentioned all sorts of things, and I've only just touched on the surface of lots of different ideas, but you will find it so much easier to make your characters all real people, understandable, alive, with dimension, and they will enrich your plot because of their behavior, which will spring out of who they are. You won't have to attach it to them later. As you write, you'll find, I know this person. I know what really matters to them. I know why they do this and this. Now, I suggest that you take your main characters, including your main protagonist, but definitely including your antagonist, whoever it is that stands in the way of your person achieving their goals, and maybe their best friend, possibly their parents, anybody else who appears quite often at least your main six or seven characters, and give them each a backstory. It doesn't have to be wildly dramatic, but something so that you know them. It could just be some small domestic incident. Having been bullied at school, I've got something planned in a story I'm about to start, the next one, where somebody was a little bit, little bit short, a little bit thin at school, and was bullied and humiliated, at one particular instance, humiliated so much he never forgot it. And he needed to feel that he was somebody's hero. So therefore, this decided his occupation. And very often, the need to heal will make somebody go into medicine. The need to find justice, to go into the police or the law. And you can think for yourself, lots of reasons why people go into occupations. But this particular person has a hero who has... Sean, also coming from humble beginnings, and seems to him to be somebody who almost always does the right thing. Now, disillusion is one of the most bitter and difficult things to deal with. We all need to believe that in some area we are a hero to somebody. And when you believe that the body of workers, men, women, whoever, are doing something good and valuable, and that makes you belong and be doing something valuable also. When you discover there's corruption in that, I've got a whole raft of story. I could, make, I could make that almost the entire story. I'm not going to because there are other things. But you can give your characters, and it doesn't need to be a main character, and you can have, you can have as many point of view characters as you want, but I suggest you don't take it above three or four, just because it makes it too disjointed, and the reader doesn't know to whom they're being loyal. But if you give these people a backstory that you learn little by little, as seems right to you, and if you plan it out on paper, you can move it around and see where it works before you start writing, everybody will be so much easier to work with because you know who they are, you know what they value, 
You know what hurts them, what embarrasses them, what they're afraid of, what they hope for, what their nightmares are, what makes them laugh or cry. You'll find that you, they'll almost write themselves when you know where they've come from. And they will affect the plot according to what they need, and it will be understandable once the reader also knows their backstory. I suggest you keep the backstory to yourself as long as you can, but you have it down so that you know exactly what it is. And reveal it bit by bit in their actions, in their words, in somebody else's insight or fellow feeling because they understand something. You can make a love story or a deep friendship story of people who have backstories that interlock so they understand each other. Again, it's that sense of, I know you, I know you understand me. We belong as friends, as partners, as lovers, as whatever it might happen to be, as people who work together. It's those beautiful moments of suddenly I understand that make your reader feel good, feel warm, feel they also understand that this is real. This is how real people behave because your people will be three-dimensional. They'll have depth. And I would suggest that you also make sure you include fairly early on people's physical appearance because that also affects who they are, how they're treated. And if you don't give them an appearance, we the reader, if we like them at all, will give them an appearance. And if you have painted that person without physical appearance, we will then put in the bits, the colours, we'll give them long blonde hair and bright blue eyes. And then we don't want to discover on page 200 that actually they're petite with dark curly hair and brown eyes. Do it for us. Let's have a sense of who this person is and what they dream about, what they want, what they're afraid of, through their actions, not through their point of view, because they will know all the secrets. You can't make your narrator lie to your reader and expect to get away with it. You might, but it's an awful risk. It's much better if this is the person they're seeking to understand and there are these sudden moments when these gulfs are bridged and then in the end you think, I know it makes sense. I know why you did this. And then if you can surprise your reader, it's wonderful. But the greatest thing is for the reader to think, yes, I understand this. I feel with this person, they're real. I will close the book, but I will not forget these people. Now go on and put your heart on the page. <laughs>